Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. Some of you who are new subscribers to the channel might know it, but I have a repair business and that business used to operate out of a store in New York City that was quite small. This is the website for my repair business. I used to do repair videos in this channel showing people how to repair things until I realized that nobody cares, nobody gives a shit. No, really. No, nobody gives a shit. I kind of stopped caring about doing it because I'd you know, spent about like 10 years making the same type of uh, content and also, you know, it gets boring to do the same thing over and over again for 10 years. But I do have a repair business. This repair business had about 12 employees at the time, and I had a space on First Avenue in New York City that was about 650 square feet. Now, one of the pieces of research I did a long time ago, just out of curiosity, don't ask what discussion led to this, is that for in order for chickens to not peck at each other, for them to get along, they need somewhere around 120 square feet per chicken so that they don't peck at each other and they get along. I had about 12 employees in a space that was 650 square feet, which meant that my employees had literally less space to do repair, component level data recovery, and everything else in a stressful environment than what chickens are supposed to have. So I decided that I wanted to look for a new place to do business out of. And this was a video series in 2019 that became very popular because I went to try and find a place to use as a new store, and the prices that I saw were just absolutely insane. This video series very interesting to me is that one of the storefronts that had been vacant in 2011 when I started looking for a place to start a store was still vacant in 2019. Eight years later, did not have a single occupant. So I decided to start filming the experiences that I had trying to rent a commercial space in New York City. And this is what I had. You have restaurants that were almost the same size as my store that were going for about forty to $50,000. You had spaces like this that was about one or 200 square feet larger than my $12,500 store. This place was 75 thousand a month. You had buildings like this that look like this that cost over a million dollars. Many of these places are pretty much empty at this point and I went over that in all these video playlists where I, all I did is I just walked around with a camera to show you all of the businesses that used to be occupied when my father would walk me around Manhattan and Brooklyn as he took me to the Barn and Bailey Circus that no longer have residents. This isn't even some sort of propaganda. It's just fundamentally the truth. There's this blog that I love. It's called EV Grieve and you know to be clear I'm not going to assign a meaning to the name. I don't know what he meant when he made that name. The way I see it is East Village Grieve. Grieving the loss of the neighborhood that I once knew and loved. When my dad used to walk me around Manhattan and New York City and Brooklyn and all these different places, when he took me to Barnum and Bailey Circus or whatever else, we used to walk into all these different small shops that were owned by small business owners and they were really cool places. Similar to how I have a space in my repair workshop where if you want to use a microscope or a hot air station or a soldering iron, power supply, multimeter, you're welcome to use that for free. There were so many small businesses like that where you just had an experience that you're not going to get it at Best Buy or a Walmart. It had personality. And a lot of these places are gone as a result of not being able to afford it because you have a place that is this size that costs $75,000 a month. And the result of when these places cost $75,000 a month is that everything is closed. I find this to be sad. Every day I would read Evie Grieve back when I lived in New York and they would talk about some new place that was closing. All these places that made up the character and the, the personality of the community were being replaced with Starbucks, Chase, Whole Foods, Starbucks, Chase, Whole Foods. The place that I had my first good date on Kosi, it was Kosi on 13th Street, in Broadway, right in front of the X1 bus stop that goes to Staten Island, that had a, a, what is it, a, a chicken pesto sandwich that was amazing. And they used to have these little coupons that were, I mean, they, 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 these little coupon cards that you could get, so you could get like five or ten bucks off, which would make the sandwich almost free. I was completely broke at the time, so I remember taking a woman here, and I was trying to take these cards out while she was in the bathroom, so that she wasn't seeing that I was trying to get her a free date. I was pretending that my card was mine and her card was hers, and the, the waitress could completely tell that I was full of shit, but she was very nice at the time. She could see that I was trying to, you know, dress decently for my date. I'm like, you know, 17 years old here. One of the things that was really awesome about this place, you know, but to be clear, I made up for it when I was older. I, I went there a couple of times and left a $100 tip just to make up for the fact that I was a piece of shit when I was 17 and broke. But this place, you know, it had memories for me. And that's now a Santander. It's not even a re I don't even think it's a real bank. It's a fucking ATM. It's a fucking ATM. All, like there was a record store on the corner that's now a Capital One bank that's pretending to be a cafe. It's really sad. So one of the things that I talked about is how commercial mortgage-backed securities are kind of destroying the entire city. And that you can see over here, I talked about it in a lot of these videos, and there's a lot of way smarter people than me in the sources that you could read about this on. One of the things that they're talking about is that you will have a building that is valued at a certain value. That value is based on what they're charging for rent. 
You see where I'm going with this? So if they start renting that property out for less money, that lowers the building valuation. If the building valuation is lowered, A, the value of a bunch of people's investments go down on paper, which is going to make them pissed. B, the bank is going to say, huh, that building was $10 million. If you're renting it for that space for a quarter of the amount, now it's worth $2.5 million. You just lost $7.5 million in collateral. So if you don't want us to call on this loan right now, you owe us before the end of the day. $7.5 million. Most of these building owners can't do that. They're leveraged out the ass. So what are they going to do? They could either bleed right now or, you know, bleed out slowly over a period of 10 to 20 years and hope that somebody else is going to come along from China or something else that's going to, you know, park their illicitly earned laundered money in that building. And that's what happens. There is an incentive structure in place in New York City for people to keep buildings vacant. And if you don't believe me, just walk around the city and see for yourself. For Lease is one of the most popular retail stores in Manhattan. Now, one of the things that I found interesting recently, and this is, you know, this, this is years after I left and just gave up on this entire charade, is the sale of a recent office building as reported in the New York Times. The New York Times reported on a building that had sold for $332 million in 2006. Do you know what it's sold for now? $8.5 million. Now, if you take a look at what the cost of a house was back in 2006, and then you take a look at what the cost of that same house is now, you'll see that it did something like this. Most real estate over the past 18 years has done something like this. For that property to be worth, what is it, like 3 4% now, what it was worth 18 years ago? It means two things. A, in a time of work from home, there's less use for buildings where the square footage is $100, $200, $500 per square foot. Two, you have officially run out of people to destroy. I mean that. There are so many businesses, there are so many places that I liked that would, within 18 months, be closed, and then somebody else would think, ah, I can make money there, I can make it work, and then they try to make it work and they fail. There's this weird fallacy where people assume that the person next to them has similar circumstances to them. And I understand this. Back 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, if you had a farm and your neighbor had a farm and your neighbor's farm is doing exceptionally well but yours wasn't, you had the same weather, you had the same tools, you had the same dirt. There must be something that I'm doing wrong. I should be jealous and envious. I got to figure out what it is that he's doing that I'm not. But in 2024, I mean, my neighbor has massively different circumstances than me. Everything is going to be different. So when you're looking at the store that's next to the one you want to rent and going, oh, he's successful. Surely I'll be successful. For all you know, he's grandfathered into some 30-year lease where he's paying $20 a square foot. And then you think I should be able to be successful, not understanding what his business is doing. And the place you're looking to rent is $200 a square foot. So you go into that place with all this excitement and all, all these dreams. And then you realize, wait a second, I can't pay $75,000 a month to run a gift shop, I'm out of here. I can't pay $40,000 a month to run a restaurant, I'm out of here. Now, there's always going to be somebody that thinks maybe I can make it work. But what happens when you run out of hopeful people because you have destroyed them is that you have this. A building that was worth $332 million has sold for $8.5 million. And honestly, even that was probably too much money. I think over time, you're going to start seeing some of these dominoes fall. And honestly, I think it's fine. If you have some investors that wind up losing their shirt because they decided to invest in Manhattan commercial real estate, I think that is going to be necessary to get rid of this garbage. I miss the New York that I grew up in. The New York that I grew up in was awesome. You had people from all over the world come into this place, trying to figure out how to make a living for themselves. I miss the New York City that I grew up in. I really do. When my dad would take me to Barnum and Bailey Circus in the early 90s, if we were early, if the bus got there early, we we would just walk around and check out the local businesses. And there were all these local businesses that were amazing. You had the best place to get falafel, Mamoons. You had the best place to get audio gear repaired, DBM. You had the best place to get your beeper repaired. Back when there were beepers, I'm that old. 47 Canal Street, High Tech Electronics. I'm not sure if it was around back then or if it was somebody else there, but I know they've been there for a damn long time. You had this place. This was the best seamstress to go to. This was the best record shop to go to. And that was awesome. Every single one of these places, they had two things in common. Number one 
is that they wanted to become the best in their craft, that whatever they did, they had genuine pride in it. When you walked into their business, you would be speaking to an owner or the protege of the owner that really cared about what they were doing. It wasn't like walking into a Target or a Walmart or a Dollar Tree and a T-Mobile store and looking at some generic display. If you walked into a cologne shop, it wasn't like Sephora. It wasn't a place where you just had a, you know, can I help you? And I'll get that from behind the glass for you. These are people that would actually get to know you, understand your life, and then tell you, based on your character and who you are, here's the scent for you. Number two, what they all had in common is that their motivation to become the best in the world at whatever they did was to avoid heaven and go back to wherever the fuck they came from because they actually experienced hardship. People like my grandmother, she loved her culture. She cared about her culture. She also didn't want to live someplace where after 15 hours a day of work for 10 years, you know, what you have to show for it is you have a goat and a cow. Like, because in her town, having a goat and a cow, you might as well have been a billionaire. She loved her culture, but she didn't want to go back there, which is why she spent years upon years working her ass off so that she could become known as the best seamstress in Sheepshead Bay. And when she was, she had a job, and when she had a good job, she realized I'm never gonna have to go back there again. I can start a family, I can live sustainably, and I'm happy. All of these businesses were started by people that wanted to become the best at their craft, that wanted to provide the best service to everybody that walked in. And the thing about New York City that made it doable is that you had such a diverse group of people. It wasn't an area where most of the people may have had kind of the same preferences. If you had an idea, that was the best place in the world to make it work because you had eight and a half million people in a space the size of Knoxville, Tennessee, and they were all different types of people. So if you had an idea and it fails in Custer, South Dakota, no offense to Custer, South Dakota, but it doesn't mean your idea was bad. You're surrounded by like maybe one or 10,000 people in a kind of homogenous environment. If your idea fails in New York City, then it's on you because you had eight and a half million people there, all different walks of people from all over the planet. If they don't like your idea there, probably something wrong with what you're selling. It was an amazing place to start a local business. I remember working out of Herald Square Park. I started with nothing. I started with $1,000 of credit card debt and $200 in my back pocket. This is what my advertisements look like. Look at this shit. I literally found this thing on, on fucking Google image search and I, I made this thing in Microsoft Paint. So that was my advertisement. This is me working in Herald Square Park because I couldn't afford an office and people would not trust me to go to their apartment. I would meet them in the park. I would have a green extension cord because it matched the color and the theme of all the cables and I would plug it in where I'm not supposed to plug it in pause. I would plug it in to one of the outlets that was where they would have live music service and everything that you were not supposed to use so that I could plug my soldering iron in or my charger so I could show my customer that the shit worked. This was when I got my first box of screens back in the day when instead of buying one or two parts, what they would call Lucy's in a Brooklyn deli, what I actually, instead of buying Lucy screens, I was able to buy actual honest to God cartons. I was getting bricks, as Gucci Mane would say. I was getting it off the boat, as Rick Ross would say. I was getting the box of screens rather than getting the Lucy screens. I remember when I could finally afford to buy 20 of them and I could offer a better price to my customers. That was awesome. Then I went on to bet this store over here. It took me three years to get this place, 186 First Avenue, and it was something like 650 square feet for 3,500 bucks. I took this shithole and I turned it into slightly less of a shithole. And then I got to a point where I could actually afford to buy this. Not only was I buying one carton of screens, I was buying so many screens that I need to upgrade to a bigger boat. I built a business out of nothing, and this was a business that after it was built, it remembered where it came from. It gave back to the community. It wanted other people to have an opportunity to follow in my footsteps. Unfortunately, those opportunities for the most part in this area are gone. When you walk around the city, it's dead. Why is it dead? Because shit like this is $75,000 a month, which means that small businesses are never going to have the chance that my business did to become something there. And that makes me really sad. I want to see the city be a bunch of bustling small businesses that offer all different types of services again. I want people to tell me, go over there, that's the best record store, and not have it be some fucking Capital One cafe filled with people that think they're hip whose parents are paying for their fucking condo. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this building going down in value 97.5% means? It means that that chance for the American dream might just exist again in New York City. That all of these places that are retail space for lease, retail space for lease, retail space for lease, it means the dominoes are starting to drop. It means somebody noticed something. Somewhere, somebody noticed something. And hopefully, that winds up being true for the rest of all of these places. Because I want all these places that said retail space for lease, retail space for lease, retail space for lease. Some banks have to have some of their assets go down on their balance sheet. And some investors lose their shirt. So what? If that's the price of the American dream being attainable again in the city that I grew up in, the city that I used to love, awesome. 
I want to see this change. I haven't even read Evie Grieve in something like 12 years. This may surprise you, but if you are doing business and your life is your business in a particular neighborhood, reading a blog that every single day goes over another failed small business in your particular neighborhood might not be the best thing to do if your aim is to have less cortisol flowing through your brain, which is a good one, by the way. I want to see businesses with character, personality, that are run by people that are really passionate about it, unless of this whole Chase, Starbucks, Santander, retail space for lease bullshit. Remember the live music venues that used to be in New York City 15, 20 years ago? Remember all the fun shit that used to be there? I miss it. And this is why it's gone. Because it's impossible to afford anything anymore. And it's not as a result of there being some sort of amazing free market. It's not a result of all these people bidding it up to the point where they're saying, I'm definitely willing to pay 75K for that. No, I'll pay 85 because I would make a more efficient use of that space than you. Well, I can afford to pay 100K because I can make an even more efficient use of that space than you. It's not like a real free market. It's more so just, you know. It's, it's money laundering. It's bullshit. It's, it's garbage on paper so that investors think that they have money that they don't. That's not a real free market. The free market exists in many areas of the country, and it works. It sure as fuck don't exist in New York City real estate. If I were to guess, something tells me that somebody who did some corrupt shit in another country who doesn't want to get arrested and have all their assets taken away is stashing their money away in what you know, my friend Sonny calls the blockchain, which is the actual physical blocks of bricks that these buildings are made out of that they are using to launder their money. And the result of all this bullshit is the death of neighborhoods, the death of businesses, the death of personality and character that I think is a chance to return to New York City again. I hope this continues to happen. I hope this happens on every single fucking building, on every single one of these blocks in the city that I grew up in. I want to see it become what it used to be. And I hope that uh, people who live in that city, who want to run businesses in that city, have the opportunity that I did to go from working in a park and having this bullshit as their fucking banner that they were hanging in, in, in packs in Amadeus Pizza back in 2008 and 2009, buying loose screen by the Lucy to be able to buy this and then someday buy this maybe finally work their way to a store like this and then turn it into that I want to see people be able to climb the ladder that I climbed in that city because it's possible it's doable it literally burned behind me it went on fire behind me and somebody else set it on fire and I hope the other people that set that shit on fire have their investments set on fire if it means that the city can return to being a city where people can actually afford to do business and the American dream that I remember that my grandma remembers that my father remembers can continue to be alive in the place that I was born let me know what you think in the comments down below you know there was one point I forgot one point that I forgot and I just remembered right as I got back from work I know somebody's gonna ask me but Lewis don't you feel bad about the real estate investors? Don't you feel bad about the owners of the buildings? And just know it's not me. It's the way it's listed, that's yeah, how I get it. But did it. you so post the ad or did they post the ad? No. I, you see, they told me. Why the fuck you lying? In the words of the South Park Cable Company CEO. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video because I have to feed Clinton. Bye now.